Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome, welcome you to our Bible study here at Sierra Nord Calvary Baptist Church on our Wednesday night. Um, we're going to go ahead and just jump right in uh, and begin uh, open to with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Hey, Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us this time to come together Lord, to to dive into your word so that we can understand it better, Lord, and let me get some questions we've had clarified or some new understanding to things we might may have read over and over and over. So we ask you to uh, strengthen and to uh, encourage our our uh, brother Clint as he uh, leads us in this study uh, to strengthen him in, in all that he does, Lord, um, as, as he seems to um, open your word for us, Lord, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand fully uh, what it is saying or more fully than what it is saying. We ask you, Lord, for those who are on their way or those who will watch this later on uh, to also get the same um, the same benefit that we get as being here together uh, in this fellowship. We thank you for all you uh, have done for us and will continue to do for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, everybody here uh, knows the rules. Have any questions, just wave your hand and uh, we'll we'll jump in and get your question answered. Don't have any any announcements uh, this week. Nope, no announcements. And uh, with that, we'll turn it over to you, Reverend Chisholm. Thank you, my brother. Good evening, everybody. This being Black History Month, I thought I would just put in a little piece. Blacks in the Bible. And uh, if my eye hold, holds up, I will go and look at pieces of black Blacks in history. If I don't get through the Blacks in history part, I'll still send the script for both to Natalie sometime tomorrow, my eyes are lowing. So here we go. As blacks, we do not have to scrape the historical barrel and of prestigious folk whose ethnic stock is unclear or definitely non-black and parade them as one of us. The Bible, in the Bible, there are prestigious blacks, but we hardly pay attention to them. The high-ranking Ebed Melech, his name literally means servant of the king, who rescued the prophet Jeremiah from a pit, is one of us. He is described repeatedly as an Ethiopian in the King James versions, old and new, but a Cushite in the New International Version, Jeremiah 38, 7, 10, 12, and 39, 16. Cushite more accurately reflects the Hebrew text. Cush was in the upper Nile region of Afri Africa, if you remember the, Af the map of Africa. Uh, Egypt is at the top, and then you go down the map and you come to, you go south of Egypt, where the inhabitants were described by Egyptians and others as being dark or black in skin coloration. Among the band of prophets and teachers in the church in Antioch, Acts 13.1, was one Simeon called Niger, N-I-G-E-R, maybe Nigeria and Niger are derived from that word in the Greek. A black man. The person who declares in the Song of Songs 1.5, quote, I am black but comely, traditional English version, is not the presumed hero or author Solomon, but the heroine. How do I know this? Because the word in the Hebrew text for black is the feminine form Shehorah, which means it's a, it's a female in the song cycle that is saying, I am black and comely. And by the way, I just said black and comely because as Hebrew scholars who are black, we prefer to translate the little consonant that is called a vav. It has two legitimate translations, either but as a contrast or and as an additional element. We, we translate it as I am black and comely. That is physically attractive, end quote. Not I am black, but comely. So the heroine declares two positive attributes of herself, black and comely, not one, namely, not one comely, 
but the other one negative black, as if black people are rarely physically attractive. Solomon, however, is declared as non-black, clearly de described as non-black in this said book, Song of Songs or Canticles. He is in fact, if he is in fact the bridegroom, it need not be autobiographical, but most people take it that he is the author writing about himself and his sweetheart or bride in the song cycle. In 510, the female heroine says of her lover, quote, my beloved is white and ruddy, end quote. That's a KJV. The Hebrew word for white is unmistakably light-skinned, but light-skinned at best, a browning in Jamaican terms, or a Caucasian type individual. And ruddy in the Hebrew suggests either a red-haired or red-skinned person. So Solomon is definitely non-black, according to the Song of Songs. The Ethiopian eunuch spoken of in Acts was indeed a black man, but he was not from what we now call Ethiopia, but from the area of modern Sudan, which is not geographically far from Ethiopia, as some of you no doubt will know. There is very little that can be found in ancient history for the landmass that we now call Ethiopia. Mention of Ethiopia or Ethiopians by classical writers such as Homer or Herodotus uh, are not the, are not con should not be confused with clear accounts of what we now call Ethiopia. This is so because the term Ethiopia was used to describe almost all of Africa in ancient times and even beyond in ancient times. See my latest book, Rastafari Beliefs, a Critical Analysis. You will find some more details on that issue. This idea of Africa, Ethiopia being used to describe all of Africa and beyond is well known and admitted by serious scholars of whatever ethnicity or color. So see Chancellor Williams, The Destruction of Black Civilization at page 105. Another book that documents this, Black Women in Antiquity, edited by Ivan Van Sertima at page 12. Edward Ullendorf, The Ethiopians, pages 1 to 12. Pillars in Ethiopian History, the work of William Hansbury, edited by Joseph Harris at page 53. 63, I'm sorry. Mention of Ethiopia in the Bible suffers from the same geographical imprecision. And as John Markakis, former lecturer at the Isle Selassie I University in Addis, that is Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, correctly said, quote, In the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Hebrew name Cush was translated into the Greek Ethiops, meaning sunburned, then into English as Ethiopia giving rise to the claim rise to the claim of Ethiopia's existence in biblical times the myth of a history that is 3000 years old end quote this also you'll find a little bit more in my book rastafari beliefs available on amazon as print or as kindle edition there is no dispute in the ancient records concerning Egypt, that blacks ruled Egypt as pharaohs from the ancient Egyptian records, especially Egyptian art. We, we know that the people, the, the Egyptians describe the people living south of Egypt in Lower and Upper Nubia by descriptive terms which would make them in our modern terms qualify as i'm sorry this is moving the thing under the qualify in modern terms for the description negro or blacks they had on the whole dark or black skins broad noses thick lips and tightly coiled hair they were called at times Ethiopians or Nubians or Kushites, either with a K or with a C, 
were the same people, people of our kind. The Napatan kingdom of Kush conquered Egypt and ruled it as the 26th dynasty from approximately 750 to 663 BC when the Assyrians drove them out of Egypt. No, I think, let me just pause there and open for any questions or comments you might have. The other piece is a little bit, slightly more technical, but that a little appetizer should help you. That there are people like us in the Bible, it's just that we overlook them, and by mistranslation, we, we miss recognizing that they are black people like we are. So questions, comments, observations on what I just read. I know it's very short, but in the interest of my very tired eyes and your very maybe tired minds. But Let's just pause there. You'll get the other script as well concerning, uh, I call it, shoddy arguments about blacks in history. Did, did you say that the, the uh, Egyptians were black? No, the Egyptians saw people south of Egypt as black. So in um, Lower Egypt and Upper Nubia, thereabouts, mm -hmm. they would describe those people as black. And they were proud, you know, and arrogant. They didn't count people who are black-skinned as equal to themselves. <laughs> and for those who are just coming in, we're talking about um, blacks in the Bible uh, for Black History Month. Um, yeah. Richard didn't put this together, just, just for those who came in a, a little late. So you're saying they, they, they were prejudiced against other black people? Oh yeah, there were prejudiced of people who are darker in color than them. Prejudiced against black people especially because they would have other peoples around them who are like themselves light-skinned or, you know, not, not exactly darker than themselves. They respect those. They had no serious regard for black people. Uh oh uh... So this color, it, it was not really called color prejudice way back then. It's just that they're, they would, if they're describing themselves, they say they're just in preferential agreement with people of their own kind. <laughs> yeah, give me a break. I don't think, you know. It was a pol polit um, political correctness. Yes, even <laughs> from then, they would, those are the nice terms they would use yeah. of themselves. Yeah, they, they're, they're insulting you, but you look back and say, oh, okay. Doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> they would have us believe that, right? Mm. Anybody else? Questions? No, I mentioned one word that is a humbug to some people today. Negro. Simply because Americans have a derivative which is appallingly vulgar. We are afraid of the word Negro. Negro just means black. And people who know of the Garveyite movement, they must remember what Garvey's movement was called, UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association. He was not embarrassed by the word Negro. It's, it's a um, language de der derivative. Would um, you take it from Spanish or is Negro is black? So, uh, and you were saying, according to what you read in the Bible, that, that Solomon wasn't black. I know you have some people who He say definitely it. was not black. You have some people so when Rastas claim that. that Selassie being a black man or a Negro, that too is a, a blunder. If you look at him, he has aquiline features. Nose is not broad, forehead not broad, lips not thick. He, as the late C.S. Reed, my pastor at Calvary Baptist in Monaco, Bay, said years ago that Haile Selassie, is more like Arabs than he is like Negroes. Hmm. But he's supposed to be the black man's God. Give me a break. And so they say because he looks dark colored, then you trace him back through David and Solomon, then they too are regarded without any evidence provided as black people as well. No support for that claim. Certainly not from the Bible. David too is described as ruddy. At best, you can get red hair or red skin, but he's not black.
Yes, I, I think we had talked about it some time ago. I guess people do these kind of things just to have something over other people. Mm-hmm. You know, I know, I know the, the whites do that with the uh, blonde hair, blue eyed um, pictures of Jesus. Yeah, and you know, just just looking where he's from, he more than likely was not that. Precisely. You know, so you know, but you have people who. I guess they're portraying it too, who didn't know or couldn't read or whatever. They just swallowed it wholesale. Lifting up to to boost their kind. Right. I said in my first book, A Matter of Principle, I would encourage, I I don't think I would use this software to encourage, I would strongly suggest to all churches to take down any picture of Jesus that you have in your houses, in your chapels, in whatever your premises you have on on your belonging to your church why there's no need to have them up because we don't need we're not worshiping them we're not looking to them for guidance visually of jesus we don't know exactly how he looked or if you think you must keep them up in your house or in your chapel or wherever that belongs to your church put up a large sign this is not a photograph this is an artistic (laughs) impression (laughs) so nobody's misled because we used to have white people in our sunday school literature and they led us three youngsters psychologically you're doing damage to them they never open a book until more recent times to see anybody looking like them and it has a way of um instinctively affecting your psyche of yourself but then the caribbean baptist um, fellowship uh, had a deliberate move to have people looking at ourselves in the sunday school literature You affirm the psyche of black children when they see black people in books that they read at school or at church. Very true. And there's other people too to you know make them realize there's other people in the world. That's right. You know, I mean, I'm sure in China they have Chinese people on their literature, you know, and and yeah. so on. Yeah, it's something that. Rev, you had something, Dad? No. Oh, okay. So you came off me. In the other piece, I chide several prestigious thinkers for the myths that they make about black people claiming everything was invented by blacks. Absolute rubbish. Contrary to history, we start mathematics and history and agriculture and this and that and the other. Where is the evidence? Guys who are so bright, they should know better. But they, are, they have gone down in print and they have left it and they have misled a number of people. We don't have to scrape the barrel of history or achievement. Just look at what our people have genuinely done. So that might, the next piece which you'll read, I send it to Sister Natalie. I chide several scholars because I find they over-argue the case and they are inventing things which they have not. They just claim it, but they don't provide any evidence in support of their claim. You can't do that if you're a serious scholar. If you make a proposition, back it up with evidence. Do you have any examples? Oh, yeah. Sheikh Antadiop, bright like Morningstar, Senegalese um, scholar. Mm -hmm. They call them polymaths because they are so specialized in several different areas of academic inquiry. Mm -hmm. And so they make those arguments and they they over-argue the case. No, no. I mean, like, um, ones where they, without any evidence, saying that... um... Yeah, she did up. this. Let me see. It. The, he has an arrogant um, omnibus scheme. Let me see if I can just pull pull that page from my material here. You guys can look at it in details later. Here, here is um, Sheikh Antadia. He says, quote, The ancients Herodotus, Diodorus, Pliny, Tacitus, et al., have unanimously informed us about one fact which 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 has come to their in attention and without which they could not be mistaken and here's his statement that he goes on the race of the egyptians that is what he says they could not be mistaken about the people whom he quotes. Mm -hmm. They all tell us 
that the Egyptians were Negroes, like the Ethiopians and other Africans, and that Egypt civilized the world. Negroes were the first to invent mathematics, astronomy, the calendar, science, the arts, religion, culture, social organization, medicine, writing, technology, and architecture. In saying all this, one simply asserts that which is in all modesty, strictly true, and which no one at this time can refute by arguments worthy of the name, end quote. So he just claims, but he does not provide one ounce of evidence to support any of these claims. And they are rubbished by other researchers who have shown who was really behind some of these things that he claims Negro started. And I'm saying for a man of his intellectual stature, globally recognized as a very bright Senegalese scholar, you don't make these blunders in print at all. Don't claim more than you can prove. I mean, I guess, I guess they figured because of his name, and I, I remember you saying that in some other things like with, with the Bible that uh, we've talked about, uh, the people won't challenge them because, you know, they've got some uh, letters behind their name, you know, or maybe yeah, it, they... It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. If you make a claim as it is with law, if you're proposing something in a court of law, you have to defend with evidence. Yeah. the proposal that you're making or the claim that you're making. I tell my students at the tertiary level, never over-argue. Go only to the extent that your evidence will support your argument. Right. So I, there's a spectrum that I use with them, especially philosophy and apologetic students. And if a thing is not ranked impossible, it is barely possible with more evidence, probable, with still more evidence, likely, and with even more evidence, certain. But you never over-argue. Stay with the evidence that you have and stay with what the evidence supports. Right. Possibility, probability, likelihood, certainty is rare. So you only argue for certainty if you have a, a good, irrefutable body of evidence that you can back up the argument that you're advancing. And use loophole language. It seems to me, rather than it is. The loophole, it, it seems, well, it appears that way to me. My eyes are defective, but that's how I saw it. Mm -hmm. All you can say is that you were mistaken. But if you say it is, they tell you you're definitely wrong. Here's right. a piece of evidence that shows that you were wrong in stating that it is, you know, this or that or whatsoever. I guess these guys were, I'm sure they're around before social media. So maybe social media is taking a page out of their book. Yeah. Because and almost of, anything of... goes up on social media now yeah. without being investigated or, yeah. or critiqued well, you know. So you can't swallow everything you see. I saw it on social media. So what? Yeah. Th that doesn't prove that it was correct. That's right. That's right. It's it's, it's more like guilty until proven innocent. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Versus that, innocent. That's how people are operating. Guilty. And they expect you to fall in line with that nonsensical approach yeah. to facts and truth. Yeah. Because then you're, the, what, what you read or watch is more true than what I read or watch. Mm -hmm. you know or vice versa show me why i should trust trust your source more than the sources i read if the sources are in conflict with one another then we have an we need an arbitration yeah what is the caliber of the person who wrote source a which contradicts source b are the person specialized in the area that is up for inquiry the fact that a man is a, has a phd in history doesn't mean that he has any qualifications on things religious or things philosophical necessarily. Prove to me that he studied those disciplines and therefore can, you know, intersperse philosophy with with another discipline that he's arguing a case about. That's what we're seeing uh, these days, though. People are oh. Oh, yeah. arguing for things that, like, um, you know, they know that it is gospel. Uh, and they have, they have no specialization the, in another area that they're talking about. That, that's right. Stay in your lane. Academically, you stay in your lane. If you I don't have the qualifications, don't speak so pompously as if nobody can contradict you when you only have an, one area of specialization or study. You know? 
And because they have a big name, you know, yeah, they, they mean, have, right, accept right. it as, as gospel. Mm -hmm. they, just, they just accept it. Yeah. Because so-and-so has said so. Who is the so-and-so? Where has he studied? What has he specialized in in his studies? So I'm a humbug when, when there are public lectures of this kind. I raise questions, challenge what they're saying. And, you know, they, they, they would think you, you're going to be intimidated to raise a question in public, not Clinton Chisholm. <laughs> I don't swallow anybody readily. Mm -hmm. I will challenge anybody. Mm -hmm. I remember there's a guy, he's a deep sounding Afrocentrist guy from America, and he was making a public lecture at UWI in the, one of the halls. And I went there because I've read him and I think he's shallow in terms of his argumentation and he's limited in terms of his knowledge of the languages that he claims he knows. And he was quoting a, 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 a passage of scripture and I, I said, excuse me, that quotation is not correct. He said, which, which, which text are you quoting? And I said, the original Hebrew. Have you studied Hebrew? Of course, everybody turned around in the lecture theater. Mm -hmm. Who is it daring to challenge this mm -hmm. well-known mm -hmm. lecturer on the university campus? I don't care who he is or how you regard him. I have read the Hebrew. I know the Hebrew. Does he know it? Yep. So when I told him I'm, I'm quoting the, I'm, I'm giving you a translation from the Hebrew text, he just backed off and proceeded. Didn't, didn't answer you? No, he couldn't. Once you challenge him like that, they, they, they get fearful that, you know, maybe somebody here knows more than I do. And I tell when I train preachers, I say, look, when you're going to prepare properly, you never can tell. A specialist in an area of Bible or just general thinking might pop into church a Sunday morning that you're preaching. Make sure you study your thing carefully. If you're going to quote a point, make sure you have the quotation right. Yeah. I remember a kind of slightly humorous um experience when I was director of Youth for Christ in Montego Bay. One of our best lay preachers, he's still still in Montego Bay at one of our Baptist churches in the hills. And he, he was closing off his sermon. Good sermon. Good evangelistic sermon. And he's going to make the appeal now. And he says, Brethren, I just want you to think of one thing. Only one life will soon be passed. And then he paused. And then quietly, but um, you know, firmly. Only what's done for Christ will be lost. He missed mm -hmm. the poem, it's not will be lost, will last. Mm -hmm. Few of us knew that he blundered, so he kind of got away with murder. But you have to just check all of those things. You never know who will be in church when you're presenting. Always prepare thoroughly. Expect a specialist at any time. That's why I approach my preaching and teaching, because I really don't know who might turn up. And who, who is who is like you and unafraid to bring it up. That's right. Or superior to me in knowledge of whatever I'm dealing with and make me look like a, a, a little pygmy. Mm -hmm. Superior thoroughly, man. Can answer anybody. There was a there was a, a, a conservative Christian, he died in the early 20th century, who said his family is from a, a, a he's from a family of long livers. He graduated, I think, from Princeton at age 21. And he says, well, following the tradition of his people, he probably has another 30 years or so minimum to live. Mm. He's going to spend it like the first 12 years to study any language that impinges on the Bible. Because he says, I don't want anybody in the world to tell me that the Bible says A or B in a language that is in the Bible was translated from, and I can't counter them or challenge them. And then he says he achieved that. Then he went on to anything in terms of geography and history with the same goal. There must be nobody who can tell me that the geography was A or B or the history was A, B, and I can't counter them or challenge them. And the Lord allowed him to live through that period. And, and I think he just fell short by one year of publishing all that he knows. Nobody would challenge him anywhere in the world if he's presenting because they know he's well studied in all of those areas that I just mentioned and more. Yes. Those are specialists. And he, he says, look, make sure the people whom you call specialists have really spent a long time in the discipline that they claim to be a specialist in. We need more of those. And I'm trying to encourage um, churches. You find youngsters nowadays who love languages. Encourage them to study the biblical languages in addition to the modern languages. 
and provide money for them so they don't have to come out of their own pockets. I know a young lady you now is seeking a scholarship to do a doctorate in apologetics. I, I told her to ask her denomination, denominational leader to provide a scholarship for her. And she raised the question with the denominational leader and he just went silent. Hmm. She has asked me for an academic reference. I taught her at CGST. She was doing a master's degree and she was easily the best student in apologetics when I taught her. She got a strong A in the course. So I would back her for a scholarship anytime. She has the, the acumen. She has the discipline having done a master's degree elsewhere. So I would recommend her gladly and readily for financial support where it's available. Where is she? I'm sorry? Where is she? She's in Kingston. Okay. She's a member of um, some, some vassal's denomination. Okay. I even told her to try Sam because Sam is in America now and he's in charge of the whole movement in America. So he should be able to pull some scholarship for her somewhere. But I don't know, I don't know what the, the result of that is yet. But I know she has applied to UWI to do a doctorate, but they usually require to do a master's and MPhil. And then if your work is progressing well, they upgrade it to a, 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 doc, a DPhil or a DMIN. Right. Anybody? Any other questions? I know, and I like Rev said, we know that you know there are black people in the Bible, but not everyone was black. <laughs> right, right, right. And not everyone was black. So you know, we have to be we have to be proud of who we are and what we know mm -hmm. of who mm -hmm. we are. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't have to make up anything. Yeah, you don't have to invent anything. You know, it is... Search history books, yeah. and the history books will tell you that there were prestigious blacks in almost every era, every period of history. And certainly from the African continent, we have produced quite a number of people who are black and very prestigious based on their disciplines. And in my CD, I know it's a vulgar announcement, but you guys will pardon it. On my website, you'll find a CD called The Church's Impact on Western Civilization. What the church has done in most of the prominent disciplines to shape Western civilization that we boast about now. But we sometimes don't know that the people who are pioneers in these fields, science, art, education, and so on, were Christians. We just know their names. But don't know that CD is very helpful for Christians who are at the upper secondary and tertiary level institutions so that they know there are Christians. You don't have to back pocket your Bible. Your Bible has been approved, has been examined and passed flying colors, all of the critical examination that people would use for a piece of literature. And you need to know that you, there are Christians who have been pioneers in music and the arts and in the other academic disciplines. Otherwise, uh, the, the atheists and the skeptics who know the history will not tell them. They want to just browbeat them in a the lecture theater by poo-pooing all Christians bar none, which is unfair academically, but they still do it. All right, anybody else? Question, observation, statement? And by the way, that the CDs on my website are now available as MP3 download because I guess the CDs are not coming with with um not even in cars or on laptops. You have to have a USB drive port or something of that nature where you yeah, can plug it in. You can get an MP3 download and you can read it on your device, whatever. Yeah, or listen to it on the your phone or your. That's right. Yeah. Or your laptop. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, All right. We, next, we're so next. next two weeks, God willing, uh, I, I think I'll send my material ahead. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be a full day. But I will send my material ahead. We're looking at the Great Tribulation or minus the 
the, the, the um, definite article, great tribulation, the what, the when. So um, somebody, uh, young brother Don, please remind your dad that we're going to be doing that next two weeks, next two Wednesdays, God willing. Because he had said he wanted to know ahead. Okay. So he can do his own preparation. Quite in order. And I'll play fear. I'll send my material before weekend to Sister Natalie. So that those of you who want to have early access to it can get it. Look and don't be afraid to challenge my ideas. As I've said repeatedly. And I said on CVM, the guy says, I say, I'm not the fourth member of the Trinity. He says, I've never heard it put that way. Mm -hmm. I say, all I'm suggesting by that is that I can blunder too. That's why I have questions after sermons and Bible studies. I'm not a member of the Godhead. All right, Lord bless. All right, everyone. Um, Reverend Ledger, you mind close us out to a word of prayer? And welcome, Miss I see, uh, Ms. Esther Lynn there. I want to welcome you tonight. So go ahead, Reverend Ledger. Okay. Heavenly Father and our God, thank you for the opportunities that are open to us to expand our minds and to think in ways that is uh, honoring to you. We thank you for our brother Clint and we ask that Lord, you would continue to strengthen him and bring healing to his eyes so that he will be able to use them for uh, the rest of his life. We thank you for him sharing with us week after week and enlightening us in so many ways. We, we pray that, Lord, you would continue to bless us as we uh, operate like this and grant that uh, what we learn, we'll be able to use it to your glory and to your honor. Hear our prayers and forgive us of our sins. So we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, brother. Night, 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 night